All right, we are live on Facebook and I'm recording. I'm John Mercer, uh, Department of Kinesiology and Nutrition Sciences. I've got co-host Ted Gerard here. Hey, Ted, how's it going? Going good today. We're uh, going to have a pretty fun interview, I hope. That's right. And this is going to be our Behind the Vita uh, podcast for the department, which uh, Ted came up with the name and I love it. So it's a little <laughs> deeper dive behind the resume of, uh, of our faculty. And the whole idea is for faculty to get to know faculty and also for students to get to know our faculty at a little deeper level than we, what we uh, may normally uh, normally do. And uh, we'll talk about academics, but we'll also talk a little bit about non-academics and things that uh, Dr. Friedman, Silver, and Al Julia does outside of, uh, outside of work. And so today our guest is Dr. Julia Friedman, Silver, and Al, a faculty member with expertise in biomechanics. And although I've known her for some time, I am really looking forward to hearing uh, her background and how her path has gone from uh, where she started in college to uh, to where she is now. So, how's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the uh, conversation. Well, why don't we dive into this and just tell us where, when did you start at UNLV and uh, where were you before that? Sure. So as faculty, I started in 2014. So I actually did my master's at UNLV, as you know. But um, so as faculty, I started in 2014. And just before that, I was doing a postdoc at um, University of Massachusetts before that. Oh, that's great. All right. So you're at UMass. So you, you already alluded to your previous uh, uh, stint at UNLV. So when was the first time you came to UNLV? Yeah. So I did my master's Goodness, I have no idea what year, but we don't need to go. <laughs> so I did my master's at UNLV after I, I did my undergrad um, in kinesiology. And then I worked in a research lab, actually with a military research lab for a little bit, doing physiology research and um, loved research, realized physiology and pipetting all day was not what I wanted to do and really ended up in biomechanics because of injuries and like sports and like a lot of us, right? Um, and so I started looking up programs and found the master's degree here at UNLV. So I ended up doing my master's at UNLV. Thought I wanted to go work for a footwear company until I actually got to UNLV and um, public speaking's never been my thing. So the idea of teaching was horrifying at first. And then I, um, it was my job to teach. So I did it and I actually loved it and realized that it wasn't scary, like public speaking. And then I enjoyed doing it. So realized that doing my own research and having my own research line and getting my PhD and getting to teach was really what I was looking for. So then I went and got my PhD. Awesome. Um, can I, I'm going to jump in because uh, I went through this a little bit too, because I did my master's at UNLV as well. What was it like for you to come back to a place where you were a student and then be a faculty member? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think for me, there was so much time in between and so many other things I was doing. And it was great because a lot of my colleagues, I, or people that are my colleagues now, but were my professors then, I, I would see at conferences. So there was kind of a evolution of that, you know, hierarchy that was able to kind of naturally progress, if that makes sense. Yeah. So. I think if I'd come back right after graduating, it would have been pretty hard. But I mean, even still, it's still hard to call some of my professors by their first names instead of, you know, doctor so and so. So it, it's it's a it's it's different, but it was also really nice because I somewhat knew what I was getting into. I was really excited to come back to UNLV. I, I love the program and did back then too. So I knew that that aspect was going to be something I was looking for. Awesome, great. I don't know if you feel the same. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I do. And it, it's, it's, it's a level of comfort too, right? It's like, you know where the buildings are, you know where the parking is, you know, like all of these little things, you know where the restaurants are for lunch, like just yeah. these little things that actually end up taking stress away that you don't even recognize. Well, and even research, right? I knew going in, I had this lab that I'd worked in for years already, right? And I was able to just jump right back in and expand on it some with, you know, with the, you know, continuation of research, but there was, I knew I could hit the ground running on my research because I knew the lab already, which is. And the, and, and the equipment too, right? Is that what you're getting at? Exactly. That's exactly what I mean. Yeah. The equipment, I knew what was there. I knew how to use it. And so it was just a really easy transition to becoming faculty, I think. Okay, great. I love it. So you talked about your research here a little bit. Give, can you give a, 
a little overview of the type of research that you do do. Yeah. Um, I study lower um, extremity injuries in terms of how people move and preventing those injuries. So both from a sports perspective of keeping runners healthy and why runners get hurt or why runners don't get hurt, but also from a perspective of at-risk individuals who are um, at risk of osteoarthritis and trying to figure out things about the way people are moving that we can maybe change or help them with to not develop injuries. So uh, I'll jump in again here. So John and I are both runners. Uh, uh, you know, you haven't helped us at all. I'm just going to tell you. I know. It's true. <laughs> so <laughs> that being said, let's take this to the practical side. Can, yeah. can, like, does your research go down the road of a practical, like we potentially could change the, the outcomes for people to, into osteoarthritis? Is that where we're at? Is that where the research is at? I mean, honestly, I don't know the area, the area that well. <laughs> So I guess two things. So one is, you know, as you guys both know from talking to other runners, the, the answer is sure, you can stop running injuries. The easiest way to do that is to stop running, right? <laughs> 100%. <laughs> but that's not what runners want to do. So if we if we know more about what's causing it, right, if, if, if we can get people in the shoe that is right for them and in the conditions that are right for them, then theoretically we can improve that. Um, from an arthritis perspective, I think that the key thing there is, is you said is the research there, some of it, right? It's, it's kind of, there's lots, it's, it's a big field. So I think the biggest thing right now, and the biggest thing I look at is we know that sedentary behavior is one of the biggest risk factors, especially in individuals who are obese. So if we can get people moving more, then they're theoretically not going to have as many problems um, and not going to develop arthritis as quickly or as young. So the problem is people with knee pain don't move because it hurts. So trying to find that balance between, well, we know you want to move, but you can't. So how can we help you to do that a little better? You know, it's interesting. Um, I have a few students of mine. They're like young 20s. And they're already in that point. Oh, well, you know, my knees hurt. I would do more, but my knees hurt. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you're 22. Yeah. It's so interesting how young you start to hear people talking about that. Right. Yeah, and, and saying that very thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And what, I wanted and what to, they, yeah, and what pathway are they going to go on? You know, if they're sedentary at 22, because of this, where are they going to be at 44, 66, right? Like it's, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm so glad you're going down, down those pathways. Yeah. And you know, the question is, are we, are we directing people in the right way to help them get to active, right? Like not everybody should be a runner. Not everybody's going to be a runner. And so to try and say, well, I, you can't run because your knees hurt. So you shouldn't do anything. Isn't going to work. So what can we do to help people? Yeah, that's fabulous. I, this is such a great topic. I'm really interested. Maybe we want to rewind a little bit and how you landed in this research yeah. area. You know, what, tell, tell us about where are you originally from? Um, I'm an East Coaster. I grew up in Delaware. So um, I spent most of my time on the East Coast, actually. Just so you know, you're the only person I've ever met from Delaware. <laughs> That's not <laughs> uncommon. I'm yeah. that person for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So all I know about Delaware is it's a good place to hide your money. It's a tax, oh, it's a, it's a tax a shelter. Yeah. So <laughs> that's all I know. Yeah. I mean, a lot of banks are, are based out of there, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, my father worked for DuPont. DuPont was based in Delaware. So um, just, I grew up there. Um, you asked about how I got into this. So I was a gymnast growing up, not a great gymnast, but a gymnast. I had lots of injuries. I ha ended up with um, four surgeries on one of my ankles. So, um, you know, I think I've always been the kind of person who wants to figure things out if there's something I don't understand. So for me, it was, you know, running injuries aren't that different than some of the injuries I had and some of the um, injuries, you know, the other athletes had. So it just trying to get into the field to try and figure out why does this happen and why, why does some injuries end somebody's career, whereas other people can kind of recover from it, but move on to the next and think questions like that. Wow, that's so. So you were really looking at injury mechanisms, injury mechanisms early on. Yeah, you know, I um, one of I was my undergrad program. We could do a, a thesis, and my thesis was a, a survey, but it was um, in, interviewing people to try and find out how um, having an injury early in life may change injuries later on. So looking at people who've had ankle injuries and whether they ended up with hip and knee injuries down the road. So. 
yeah, it, it's always kind of interested me. Oh, that's pretty neat. So where, I, I'm sorry, where was your undergrad again? University of Maryland. Okay. And did you go right into, was it exercise science there or what did you do? Kinesiology. Um, okay. No, <laughs> no, I was pre-med for a, a semester or so. And then once I decided that wasn't for me, I, I actually was even a business major for a semester. And then oh. that didn't take long for me to realize it wasn't quite right. I didn't know what kinesiology was at first. And then I had um, a friend I was taking some classes with was telling me about it. And that's how I ended up there. Oh, you know, many of us don't even know what kinesiology is today, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have an interesting question, or I think it's an interesting question. It's interesting to me is, and I'm, and sorry, we didn't prepare you with this question, but you, you, you made me think of it. In, okay. in your research you're doing right now, yeah. if you were able to answer just one question with a yes or no, like in the, in the area, what would it be? Or just even maybe not a yes or no, like, we all, we all have things in our fields that, oh man, that's the unknown. Yeah. What, what would it be in, in your field? A yes or no, or what could I answer? That's, that's a tough one. Um, I guess, you know, I think getting back to what I was saying before, the injury mechanism, right? So if we know that doing this is, you're going to end up injured, but if we just do this slight change, we could not be injured. So what is the slight change? What is that slight change? What is it that pushes somebody to be injured and not be able to do something anymore and versus somebody else who just is good? I mean, what's the magic dust? (laughs) But yeah, I mean, there's, there's people, you know, in the the years I've been doing running research, we've had 75 year old runners coming in who just finished a Vermont 100 miler. Like Mm. that's, that's always my go-to example. Like, why is he able to do that at, you know, at that age without any problems yeah, and it's, it's fascinating right like so fascinating you know, even i'll speak to myself like every time i up my running to a certain level even if i go really slow and incremental and planned i still always seem to get injured yeah and it's you know but then i have friends that like once again they're doing 100 miles a week and and they don't get injured and it's like what is that magic sauce well, one of the things that we've talked about, and you know, um, one of my former students, Christy, you guys know, um, we'd always talk about, is it that they're not getting injured or is it that they don't think of something as an injury that somebody else thinks is an injury? Oh yeah. You know, is, is, you know, because runners will say, no, I'm healthy. I don't have any injuries, but then, well, does this hurt? Yeah, yeah, that hurts, but it's fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I get it. So, so maybe it's, a, maybe it's the perception. I think it's a combination. I think it's a perception. I think some people are just going to be hurt more easily. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to mention that work because it's pretty innovative to look at injuries, not as a, a binary yes, no uh, answer, but um, but it's much more of a continuum. You, you've been really trying to wrap your arms around that injury issue, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, trying to figure out the the what and the why, yeah. Do you think you'll ever be able to answer the question? No, I think we'll get more information that helps us exactly. to get to more solutions, right? But I think that there's never going to be one solution for everyone anyway, so. Yeah, yeah. All right, so now you're going down this kinesiology path from an undergrad and, and obviously came to UNLV and did your master's. But what, you know, there's so many different areas you can focus in on in kinesiology, mm-hmm. uh, which is great and terrible at the same time. So what yeah. drew you towards the biomechanics uh, arm of kinesiology? Yeah, sure. So I think, as I mentioned, I, I worked in a lab in between undergrad and my master's where I was doing physiology. Um, and so it was a military university and we were doing really cool studies looking at um, hormonal responses um, to exercise and uh, also just other measures for more military related stuff as well. But um it was really interesting. I loved it, but I, I would always look at the runners and the, when they were doing a max test, they weren't necessarily runners, but I'd look at things and I'd want, I just, I liked the bigger picture, right? We were doing so much of the small level stuff. And so then I just, I, I dove into the literature and was looking at things. And that's really where I ended up on biomechanics was to, to kind of be able to look at a person see how they're moving was just what I, what I felt like was something I could see myself spending more time on. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's a, a connection to your gymnastic background because it's so technique 
uh, specific. So that, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, everything's about precise motion, right, in gymnastics. So if you're not doing something exactly the way it's supposed to be done, you don't get the right points. So or you could break an ankle. How many how many ankle injuries did you have? <laughs> Just one major injury. Oh, okay. But you said four surgeries, <laughs> like, right? Four surgeries. So it must have been pretty major. Yeah. yeah you know. <laughs> so if I was a student and I was going to take your class, yeah. What would be some of the more critical things that that you would want to impart upon me that I would learn? Yeah. So I think um it depends on the level of the class, right? Let's so say the, like the 300 level. That's what I didn't say. Let's start with the undergrad class. I think the biggest thing I, I, my biggest goal for my undergrad, my 300 level class is that I want students to take away from it is how they can use the information when they go on to something else, because most of our undergrads aren't going to go to get their PhDs in biomechanics, right? It's just not that common. So I, you know, I really want them to be able to take something from it that they can apply to whatever they're interested in. And that's always my goal. And that's what I tell them as well. And also just the critical thinking piece to, to take that leap from here's what this says on paper and here's how to calculate this, but what does that mean and how can you use it? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. All right, so now I always like to get, get a sense of the hardest question uh, you've been asked. The hardest question I've been asked by a student or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I, I'm going to go to a grad level now, but I think um, the hardest question I've asked from students is, should I take this job or what should I do, right? The questions that get to something that I can't answer because it's not like I can, I can pro con list with anybody, right? But I can't tell somebody else what the best thing for them is. So trying to, to help students get to that point where they can figure that out for themselves. That's a great one. That's right, because that's a life changing answer. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah no, that's great. And, and then I think we, all, I think we all go through that, you know, uh, how many times, John, is that same thing happened to you? And it's like, I don't want to I don't want to tell them like what I think is best for them, because I don't want them to like, come back a couple years later. You told me <laughs> and my life is horrible. I should have went down this pathway. And what's best for me might not be best. Exactly. For them. So that's you know, it's it's I guess that's the thing it's it's the questions that there is no right or wrong answer to that are the hardest for me to answer well I love that because one of the one of the questions I actually was thinking about ahead of time was um about mentoring because you you do a great job of attracting students to work uh, in your lab mm -hmm. and on your research projects I'm curious as to what type of student is drawn to you and what type of student do you look for to uh to get engaged with your group yeah, it's a good question. I think um, just students who are interested in doing what I'm doing. So, you know, a lot of times we have students come around that want to get involved, but they don't necessarily know what they want to do or they want to do something and it's not, it just doesn't align with what I'm doing. And what I tell them is that they'd be best finding somebody who does do something they're interested in, right? Because we get to this level, we're so specific in what we do. And if I'm mentoring a student, whether it's an undergrad who wants independent study in the lab or a grad student, I want them to get the experience that they're going to get the most out of. So really trying to, to find that match, I think is so important in research. Hmm. No, that's great. And yeah, it is, it, you know, it does take a, some effort by the students to research what you do and, and other people as well, because the, that, that match, like you said, that is so critical. Uh, because then they can draw on your expertise in this area when there is a good match. And if there's not a good match, then it's, it makes it harder for everybody. Yeah. And I think I, I'm not really, I'm not afraid to tell students, Hey, I might not, I'm not the best person for you to work with. And I'm not afraid to direct them to people I think might be a better fit. So I think that's important is to, to realize for me is to realize that just because that I can say no to something, right? I can say, this isn't going to be best for you and it's not going to be best for me either. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. I, I want to ask you another question about your, about your research, more of a fun one. <laughs> yeah. um, what's your favorite piece of research equipment mm -hmm. that you enjoy, you enjoy working with the most and why? Huh. 
Um, I don't equipment. I mean, what I use the most is 3d motion capture, right? But you enjoy so, it the most. <laughs> I honestly, I think the programming and the coding afterwards is what I enjoy the most getting into the data and figuring out what, what we've collected, what it means and find, you know, finding the answers, like, you know, all of the collection that that's good and great, but getting to the actual answer is what I'm always. So you like the data processing side. And and the yeah. data, data interpretation side, I guess, would be yeah. more of the processing. Both and what, and what do you them. use to, to help you with that? Is there some software that uh, is particular to your field? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, of pro there's a number of programs. I, you know, I use a few of them, but, um, but you know, what do I use? It's, it's mostly literature, right? We read the literature, we, we figure out ways to look at things and how to apply it to what we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a lot of coding. So MATLAB. Visual 3D programs like that. Okay, so then I'm going to follow up. Then um, mm -hmm. when you speak of the literature, because I do believe it's super, super important. What's kind of your go-to uh, source? I get, uh, you know, I honestly don't know in, in in your world which journals, which which whatever is 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 most influential to you. Um, I don't know that there's a specific journal. Just like keeping up with the literature in general, and just watching. You know, we get the alerts for papers that are similar to the things you've been reading or papers similar to the things you're, you're publishing and just okay. trying to, to keep up that way. But. Okay. I'm going to ask it in a different way. It, what would be the gold, your, your gold standard, if you could get something published in this high level journal, what would be the one? Oh, I don't, I don't think I look at it that way to be perfectly honest. Okay. Um, Cause in my field, like the journal of athletic training is like the gold standard, right? Like that's the one you'd like to, you'd probably like to go for first, but I, yeah, I don't know I what it is that, about mechanics. Well, I don't know, John, maybe you have a different thought on this. I think for me, it's, it, we have so many different areas of biomechanics, right? So sometimes a, a project we do fits really well in that journal or okay. really well in this journal, right? If I'm doing footwear research, footwear science is a place I'll go, but if I'm doing you know, it, it really just depends if it's really clinical. We have some more clinical journals, so. Fair enough. I sorry, I sorry to put you on the hot spot. I just, yeah, no, no, I, no, I, I was more interested for me uh, than, than anything else. I was sitting here trying to answer the question for myself and I think I'm, I'm stumped as well, just like, like Julie, <laughs> because we have, you know, journal like gait and posture, which is great for a very clinical gait study. Then we have journal exactly. applied biomechanics, great study or a great journal that's really much more of an applied but in depth biomechanics perspective of something. And then, you know, you, you have lots in between. You can even go into like a European journal of applied physiology or journal strength. There's so many different paths. I, I think this is one of the neat things about biomechanics is that we do flex in different areas. And so you do have several different uh, journals that you can, uh, can select from. So along the same line of question though, I'm interested when someone finds out that you teach biomechanics and you do biomechanics research at UNLV, yeah. what's the first question that they ask you? Or what's a typical question that they ask you? Yeah, most of the time it's, wow, that sounds fancy. What is that, right? Like, <laughs> nobody, people don't know what biomechanics is. So my, my go-to answer is normally, yeah, I study how people walk, how people move, things like yeah. footwear, right? And so then the follow-up question is always, oh, footwear, great. What shoes should I run in? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go down that path. But. And what's your answer for that question? Yeah. What shoes should John and I run in? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the answer I give them. It depends on the person, right? We all know that, right? No shoe is perfect for everybody. So finding the right shoe for you is what matters. But I love it. Yeah, no, it's spot on. Okay, so now what do you like to do outside of work when you're not spending time <laughs> writing code or reading manuscripts or mentoring students? What do you find yourself spending your time hanging out with my kids, right? And my husband. So <laughs> family is important to me. So doing a lot of things with family, even in the summer, you know, we, we travel to see family oftentimes, um, which has been really fun in the pandemic because it's meant a couple of cross country road trips. Oh, and so we get to see everything in between. Um, but that's the other thing about the pandemic is it, it's gotten us to be a little more creative. So we've spent a lot of time doing projects with our kids around the house. So whether it's building candy dispensers out of Lego or um, one of my older son's been, he was creating board games. So inventing his board games and finding ways that we could actually create them out of materials, right? So how can we make it and just making different things? Oh, that's so, great. And board games have made a resurgence. <laughs> it's become really popular again. 
Yeah. It's so something kind of you can do games? over a Zoom, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, what kind of board games do are they drawn towards? The Monopoly type or the Sorry Chance type? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, any of those um, or anything related to, you know, Avengers or things like that. So a lot of the games make uh, Avengers versions of them. So, uh, yeah. That was actually giving me my question. So that's perfect. Yeah. So um, obviously, you know about like Marvel Universe and all this stuff that uh, you probably is. It, it, it's cool with your kids. Um, yeah, I'm a boy mom for sure. So I was, I was gonna say um, when I'm gonna just move it a little bit to what you said about traveling across country and <laughs> with your family. Yeah. What was uh, what, what's the most memorable thing uh, along the way that you saw or did together? Um, yeah um so it's fun because we did it two years in a row so we've taken th the three different routes across the country too so we did um 70 and then we did 40 and then we did um the 80 route back so we got to see a lot of things um just honestly we I love being in the mountains. So just getting through Colorado and getting to be up there was really pretty and seeing that. But I think just getting to see the different parts of the country and how it looks and to show my kids how different parts of the country look, right? Like you get across and there's there's trees, right? We don't, we don't have <laughs> trees like that here. Our mountains are, are brown versus, you know, you get to the East Coast and there's green mountains, right? So just getting to see all that okay. and to, to show them that, I guess. Well, that's pretty, yeah. it's pretty awesome to, to, to show your young children that, right? So few, yeah. so few, so, so few children actually get to, get to, get to see that. That must've been really fulfilling for you. That was nice. It was, and I mean, heck, I never thought that they would <laughs> let us get cross country both times that easily. I mean, they're pretty young, but um, they enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah. That, that is interesting for you to go from the East coast to the Southwest and then have your kids being raised in the Southwest and bringing them to the East Coast. It's very, you know, <laughs> very uh, different perspectives. Of, of Yeah, the first time we went across, we got into the mountains and they were shivering. I'm like, guys, it's only 75. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, do you, have you taken them to the West Coast as well? Of course, yeah. yeah. yeah we've, um, you know, we've been to California quite a few times and, um, have family up in the um, Oregon, so we've we've done some some other trips as well. We haven't done as much driving around there though. Uh, those, okay, so those are three very different coastal regions from East Coast <laughs> to California coast to Oregon coast. Where where do your does your family tend to gravitate to wanting to go towards? Oh, I don't know. I, overall, I don't know if we, I could answer that. Um, for me, I mean, I'm still. I still love the beach on the East Coast. So uh, uh, yeah, I grew up going there. <laughs> I find the East Coast water to be a little darker. I, I, I tend to like the California coast right now, but. But it's cold. The water's cold it's, always. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was uh, traveling the summer and there was someone from the East Coast and they were literally, they got to the Pacific Ocean for the first time ever. And they we were just talking like, oh my gosh, the ocean is so angry on this side. <laughs> and I was like, I never really thought about it, but on the times on the, but on the East Coast, it definitely yeah. the surf doesn't seem like it's as big. It doesn't not seem, as tall. And, yeah. and it's not as rough. Like the, the, the coast isn't as rough. And definitely it's it's definitely warmer on that side uh, as well. But I never heard someone quite say it like that. I'm like, yeah, it's a little bit more angry. Yeah, but the water's clearer over here, right? It's right. not as so it's kind of that contrast. It's not as the the waves aren't as as big on the east coast, but the water isn't as clear. So it's kind of surprising. But yeah. All right. So one more one more question back to the Avengers part. When you watch oh, those with your with your kids, are you sitting there thinking biomechanics while you're watching the Avengers? Like, this is this is physically right? impossible to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So let me be very clear. My um, oldest son is finally now allowed to watch the movies. The little one's certainly not watching those yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's it's really fun to watch with him because he he wants to create all these things, right? And so to look at it and say, well, we'd never be able to make that. That wouldn't work. We can't, like, that's impossible. So yeah, I mean, everything comes through with a biomechanical lens, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. Julia, this has been so great. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us and just sort of chat. 
Yeah. Uh, you've been a great department, uh, a great member of the department, and it's really uh, neat to hear more about your research, your academic background, and your family. Thanks. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah thank you. That was great. Well, I hope right. you have a have a great uh, rest of your day, and it's almost the almost the weekend. It's the pre weekend, so uh, yeah, and it's supposed, to be, it's supposed to be really nice weather this weekend. So mm -hmm. hope you have a good time. Thanks. You too. Okay. All right. Thank you.